Welcome to the Ridgecrest Podcast. This is where we take time to look at various cultural, uh, community, or even church-related issues uh, that impact us as believers. Um, we try to look at those from a biblical worldview. Uh, my name is Matt. I'm the executive and discipleship pastor here at Ridgecrest. And of course, as always, our senior pastor, Michael Estes. How are you today? Very well. And yourself? I'm very well because it is opening day of baseball. Yeah. And the Braves defend. They, they are now defending their world championship. They're yeah. Been enjoying that over the course of the winter, and so we are now defending world champions. And I uh, decided I was going to represent the A today. Yeah. Um, so that's what I'm doing. Very um, cool. Do you have a? Well, before that, we got to talk about the coffee mug. Yeah, you got a new mug. Yep. Um, this one, I've I've also had this one on the podcast before, way back in the day. Okay. Um, it's a it's a mug that I picked up just because I I like the way it looked. It's very colorful. It's got fireflies in it. Um, okay. It's it's it was a mug that was painted and put together by a guy named Wyatt Waters. He's a hmm. famous local artist in Clinton, the town that I grew up in, and so um, I just liked it because of the way it looked. Yeah. Do you ever buy things because you like the way they look? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Like aesthetically pleasing. Like yeah. you look at it and you're like, this makes me feel good. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so, I'm trying to think of something specific. I can't think of any off offhand, but, but I've, I have, oh yeah, I have bought books just because I like the cover. Oh wow, that was a mistake. <laughs> but um, at least they look good on the bookshelf. They do. Yeah. Um, but I am drawn aesthetically to certain yeah. things, colors in particular. I'm like, yeah. I, might, I might just get that for just because I like the color. Yeah, that's all right. I'm a mark for people who <laughs> like, you know, spit, like <laughs> using very soft colors and yeah. that sort of thing. So, yeah. um, so I, I, was talk, I was about to ask you a question about, do you have like favorite sporting events that you like to watch? Either okay. in person or yeah. on TV, you have days you look forward to that sort of thing. Yeah, um, in person, I would say there's absolutely nothing better than playoff hockey. Okay, um, I've you know, and I'll, and I'll preface that by saying I've been, I've now been in person. I've been to a major league baseball game. Mm -hmm. I've been to Omaha College World Series. Yep. I've been to college football games. I've been to the NFL football games. I've been to a you know, college basketball games. Mm -hmm. I've been to an NBA game. Mm -hmm. um, I've been to a um, U.S. Men's National Team soccer game. You know, well, so, I'm a little jealous. I, I think that'd be um, fun. I've you know, so I, so I, I've been to a lot of sporting events. Mm -hmm. I've been to an NFL. Uh, uh, it was the NFC Championship game. You know, okay, been to that. You know, so I, I've been to a lot of sporting events, and I, I still say of all the ones I've been to in person, playoff hockey is the best. Um, super high energy. Um, at least if you're a Preds fan. Sure. I mean, if you're, you know, other other places may not have as great of a environment. Who's rival? I can never remember. Well, that's a good question. Um, we we've learned to rival a good bit of people. Um, gotcha. You know, the Blackhawks is a you know pretty yeah. pretty strong rival. Dallas Stars, you know, they're in division and yeah. kind of you know pretty strong rival. The Blues, I mean. Mm -hmm. You you know I I even remember back when like the Red Wings and the Predators had a really good you know kind of rivalry and Red Wings beat us a good bit but it was still a fun they beat rivalry. a lot of people a good bit back yeah, in the day yeah that's right and that's kind of when you know, they were they were we were in division and everything and so that is some conference alignment but uh but yeah and so so I'd say in person that's that's it and even if you don't know the sport it's still just so much fun because I mean it's it's so fast you mm -hmm. know crowd gets into it you know, have a lot of the fun kind of music and stuff that goes on throughout the game and the fun things that will come up on the jumbo trunk all those sorts of things i think playoff hockey is a really great you know in-person sports environment yeah i think for me it, it kind of depends on what you want out of the yeah. out of the the event for me i have enough like high emotion high drama in my life, not that I'm a super dramatic person. I, mm -hmm. I hope nobody takes that away from me. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's what I hear. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe I'm just an emotionally expensive person, and we're going to talk about that today. And just be, yeah, you that's know, right. I'm going to let it all out, and <laughs> this is what the whole episode's going to be. Um, don't tune out yet, okay? Um, I like I like a really laid back sporting atmosphere that can mm -hmm. get loud when necessary, and so yeah. like. There is nothing better, and part of this is because of where I've grown up and where I went to college. There is nothing better to me than good college baseball in, yeah. in person because I love the pacing of baseball. That's part of the reason that I think it's 
the greatest sport yeah. ever created. And it's, and it's different. Yeah. Of any of the sports I've been to, very different. So one of the things that makes baseball unique is that there's not a clock. So you're not trying to hurry up and have anything happen. It's just I, I like the fact that they're trying to put pitch clocks in and stuff like that so pitchers yeah. can't take an hour to throw a pitch. I mean, batters have to get in the box and actually swing the bat. But, like, I like the fact that we're going to play until nine innings are done. Mm-hmm. In high school baseball, you're playing until seven innings are over. Whether that takes three hours, whether it takes five hours, whether it takes an hour and a half. Yeah. You're going to play all those innings, and you're going to finish the game. Yeah. And there's something about the fact that, like, there's a certain unknown. Like, how long will I be here? What's going to happen today? And yeah. um, on, on that side of things, I've been to some really good playoff hockey games yeah. that – you feel like they're never going to end, you know, because, sure. cause, you know, you're, you're tied and playoffs it's, you know, you you're play another full, you play yep. another full period. Yep. Um, and you know, and, and, and or until mm-hmm. it's sudden death, first person to score and it's over. But right. if it's still tied, which is awesome in its own right. Oh yeah. It's, it's wonderful. And I mean, if I'm not mistaken, Nashville, it, it's up there. Um, they have a few games that are up there for the longest games ever. Yeah. And, and it's it's a lot of fun. But So, yeah. So, like, as far as, like, my favorite day of the year, there there are a couple of those that, like, I really enjoy the first day of March Madness. Like, when yep. when they start playing and you you get up in, like, 1030 in the morning, there's basketball, like, yeah. meaningful basketball happening. And it goes until, like, 11 or 12 o'clock at night. Yeah. Um, opening day of baseball is a good one just because – like it's back and the weather is usually improving at that point in a lot of places. Now I have seen a lot of opening day games that were played in snow, um, yeah. which is kind of funny <clears throat> to me because that's not a baseball, right. that's not baseball weather at all. Um, but like, and they, they start early in the day and they play until late at night and it's pretty great. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, as far as watching, just like maybe not being mm-hmm. in person, you know, watching, I probably look forward to college football opening weekend, mm-hmm. The, you know, maybe my favorite to watch on TV because similar to March Madness time, you get you know it's your first weekend after really a yep. hiatus of sports because you have a couple of months there. It's like really a dead period where nothing's going on. It's just Major League Baseball, and if you don't yeah. have a rooting interest, sometimes that can get old in the That's right. season. That's right. So, so I do like I, I look forward to that opening weekend of college football mm-hmm. back in the swing of things and watching. All these teams usually first weekend you have some upsets and because right. no one's ranked appropriately yet and you know so yeah so I'm a sports guy I love watching sports whether it be in person or um, on TV but but yeah that's a we, good question we did talk about as a staff I've got to come up with analogies better analogies that aren't sports analogies yeah. and I mean, it's just natural I just enjoy competition in sports and that sort of thing but um, it's funny that we spent the entire first five. Six, seven, at eight, least ten yeah. minutes of yeah, the podcast right. talking about sports, and yeah. we have a segment of our audience that's like I don't I don't care. Yeah, like it, it doesn't matter what sport you think is favorite. Can I fast I'm forward to the next thing? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's a you great little button. Can. If, if you're listening on iTunes or your Apple Podcast, there's a little 15 second plus where that's you can right. skip ahead 15 seconds. Hit that a few times, you know, and well, hopefully you're getting there now. <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't start skipping now because now we're getting into the good stuff. Right? That's right. That's right. Uh, so in our last episode we began kind of talking about different categories of people who have disengaged from the church. You had mm-hmm. your nuns who have no religious affiliation, which we said is about 62% of our community around the country, maybe more, maybe less, depending on where you live. Right. Um, then you have your duns who are kind of done with church. You know, mm-hmm. they're ex evangelicals kind of the term we talked about last time. Um, they've left the church, whether it be for theological issues, other, you know, things, you know, they've just gotten gotten fed up with the church. Yeah. They've disengaged. I would argue that most of those folks, it's they've left because of hypocrisy more than anything else. I think that that puts yeah. the blame on on us and not yeah. on them. That's it's right. It's not that they were looking for a reason to leave in every case. Sometimes they were, but uh, in a lot of cases, it, it was the fact that people just did not do what they called other people to do. Yeah, that's right. And then the third category we talked about and spent a little bit more time on last week were the this kind of new category that is referred to in this Christianity Today article called the ums. Mm. And these are individuals who have kind of disengaged but they're different from the duns in the fact of they still want to engage. They just don't know how to get back there. You know, That's for right. whatever reason, they've faced different challenges that have caused them to, you know, get disconnected from the church. And they they recognize the value of, you know, being involved in the church, 
they follow Christ. They, they, they want that and they understand mm-hmm. that. They just don't know. They're kind of in this lost kind of place right now of not knowing how to do that. And so in our last episode, we really talked about two categories of the ums. Mm-hmm. The first were those who are disoriented. These are individuals who, due to major life changes, have disengaged, whether it be you know, a loss of a job or a change of a job, you know, moving, you know, moving, um, childhood life stages, you know, all those types of things, you yep. know, um, death, death in their family. Those sure. Sort of things, yeah. Um, and then you have the next that kind of, you know, they're what we called demotivated. Mm-hmm. You know, these are individuals who have disengaged due to failures in the church. And we kind of mm-hmm. talked about a little bit that I believe a lot of these who are demotivated, Ums, this is kind of their stepping stone towards the duns uh, yes. of the different ones, and we talked about that a little bit. Um, and so this week, I want us to kind of talk about the other two categories, and we'll kind of talk about that, and then we'll kind of wrap up our time, you know, discussing a little bit how how do we move forward and how do we mm-hmm. reengage if 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 you find if someone finds themselves in one of these categories, or if you're someone who is connected to the church and want to connect someone who's in one of these guys how do we how do we move there so where we left off last time was with the group um the next group is those who are discouraged yeah um these are individuals who you know have experienced you know a loss of relationships specifically whether it be death divorce distance Mm -hmm. um you know just dealing with this grief i think post-covid this is one that's a lot more prevalent because you've lost relationships not out of death or divorce but just the church, it changed, and you had all these very – what you thought were very close friendships and relationships. Now all of a sudden you have to go virtual, and you're not seeing these people for an That's extended right. amount of time. And so now it's all of a sudden like I had – like, and I come back to church like this isn't the church I remember because this friend, I don't have as close a relationship with them anymore or whatever mm-hmm. it might be. And so, so there's some people who are kind of in this – discouraged phase because of a loss of relationship yeah one of the big things that they're doing studies on right now and particularly with young people because they're trying to figure out how the pandemic has affected people in school the young 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 people in school and um the the study uh, the studies that we've looked at or i've thought about and listened listen to some stuff when it, when it comes to kind of like what's going on out there uh these are things that affect both young men young women uh and i know the the effects aren't just in those categories. So I'm going to mm-hmm. use those as generalizations for the rest of us, but it may look a little bit different for the rest of us. But um, th- the studies have shown that there is, while there were some issues ahead of the pandemic, the things that things that were going on already before the pandemic, where we saw mental health becoming more and more of a crisis um, in circles within the church um, and in the world at large, since the pandemic, during the pandemic, and after the pandemic, uh, which we I think we were probably safe to say that we're in a post-COVID world. I, I, it doesn't mean COVID's over. It just right. means that we've we've been able to move to a point where, like, now we can. What does it look like to live after COVID? Yeah. Um, the the studies have shown that there are massive mental health issues that have come up as a result of high rates of anxiety, high rates of uh, suicidal thinking. Um, and so much of it is directly related to the loss of Im- – I'm going to use the word embodied. We're going to talk about disembodied in just a minute. Yeah. But embodied community. Yeah. Um, it, it's different when you're not around people all the time. You, and, it, and it goes to like there are different levels of this. Like one is you could have had people that you considered close friends, close community within your church. You're separated by by the pandemic. Um partially because like we're still trying to figure out what to do and so we go virtual for a little while then when we stop going virtual we're like is it really safe to be around each other so i'm going to hold back i'm going to be careful and ultimately you find out like those people that you thought were really close to you weren't as close as you thought because like you quit making time for each other yeah you weren't as intentional about like i need to i need to continue this relationship i need to strengthen this relationship i need to need to Build this or this relationship happens naturally as the course of my life goes on, the rhythms of my life go on. I see these pe- people on Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, whatever. How, fill in the blank whenever you right. would meet for <clears throat> for religious church activities. You see each other. You spend time together. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> so all of a sudden that's interrupted, disrupted, and you weren't intentional about keeping it. And now you find yourself, well, do those people really care about me at all? Did I care about them? Right. 
Um, and you're trying to re-figure out all of those relationships that you thought you had that maybe you don't really have. Yeah. And that can be a, that can be a hard thing yeah. to work through. And I, and I think you know, it's also important to note that just because maybe you, you aren't as close as you once were That's right. doesn't mean the relationship's gone. Yeah. It just means it looks different. And mm-hmm. that difference in and of itself is tough. You know, I'll give you an example. Like, you know, when uh, prior to Whitney and I moving here, you mm-hmm. know, we had, you know, another couple that we were very close to. Um, you know, I would definitely, you know, we, we would consider them our best friends, you know, and they were, you know, we developed a relationship, you know, over the past probably, you know, four or five years. I can't remember what it was prior to moving here and, you know, just, you know, really close friends with them. And so, you know, but then when we moved here, you know, it's, it's different, right? Mm -hmm. We're still close, you know, and we all, when we go back home and visit, you know, you know how usually when you're going back home to visit family, you're having to do all your family stops. You don't really have time to visit friends that you, well, they are friends that we always make time to go see yeah. because they were our, our best friends. And, um, you know, and even, you know, they have came here and visited us some. And so yeah. you still have that, but, you know, we went from, you know, on the weekends through the week, you know, they, they'd be over at our house four or five times a week, mm-hmm. you know, we'd be over at their house, you know, and, and that sort of thing. And so you do have this constant interaction and then when you move, you all of a sudden don't have that anymore. Right. And you're like, oh, well, now that I'm not talking to them every day, does that mean that we were never close or, you know, those types of things? When that's not necessarily the case, it's just life change happens, different things mm-hmm. occur. And so we've got to be careful and not, you know, we can be discouraged very quickly. Yeah. I, I can see that if we, if we look and have the same expectation for what relationship has to look like. Yeah. And there, there's something that's like, you're not, you had you didn't say out loud in that, but like there there is a, a tremendous amount of vulnerability that has to to take. You have to be open to relationship, sure. And then when that's gone, you have to figure out how to reopen that. Like, oh yeah, to to make make it possible to be vulnerable with each other again. And do I want to keep being vulnerable with this person still? Right. And those sorts of things. So like, it's a, it's relationship building by itself is hard in mm-hmm. a pandemic is almost impossible. Yeah. And so, especially new relationships. Yeah. So, I definitely see the the discouragement part is something that we have to we as a church have to be careful to address and understand that it may take time for people to reintegrate their the mm-hmm. church into their life and those relationships into their life, and we need to we need to figure out ways to be welcoming to them, sure, so that they feel safe to reintegrate. Yeah. The church into their life. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Um. And so, so we've talked about. Those who are disoriented, demotivated, and discouraged. The last category that the article mentions are those who are disembodied. Mm-hmm. These are individuals who, you know, based on the example, is really rooted in COVID, right? You know, mm-hmm. and it's specifically looking at this idea of online worship, how it went to online worship, and they realized that it just didn't work, right? You know, it just didn't work for them, and they recognized that, you know, they they were kind of disembodied from the corporate gathering and you know it's like that online didn't work for me and now i don't really know how to get back and 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 that sort of thing and you know through that rather than staying somewhat connected digitally now they've kind of found themselves completely disconnected just because they weren't able to kind of maintain at least a thread of connection through that digital period yeah here here's something to think through when it comes to like because you may think to yourself it doesn't make any sense like why would you not want to show back up and be around other people? And like, if you miss that aspect of it, why would it, why would it be hard for you to come back? I'll never forget the first time during the pandemic where, you know, we were in the middle of that thing and everything basically was virtual. We may have still been having virtual church at that point. I don't remember exactly when this happened, but I was watching an old football game on like SEC network or something mm-hmm. like that. And it was an ESPN, you yeah. know, company uh channel and i'm sitting there watching it and all of a sudden they pan to the crowd and there's all these people and i immediately felt anxiety about it because hmm. i was like we're not supposed to be that close like what are they what are we doing and then i had to remind myself no this happened in the past like before covid was a thing this was happening and i was like i need to deal with the fact that like my view of crowds, my view of large groups of people and large assemblies 
has changed. Yeah. And I need to figure out whether that's good or bad. I need to, I need to figure out how I feel about it. And then I need to figure out how I can re-engage in those large groups Mm -hmm. in a way that I feel safe. They'll feel safe. And it's easy for us to sit here now, especially those that, that have gotten to a point where we're like, we feel comfortable being in large crowds and stuff like that. It's easy for us to be critical of those that are like, uh, well, I, I just don't know how to reconnect. We need to remember, uh, and this is where I think emotional intelligence and empathy is really important for yeah. us as believers. <clears throat> we need to be able to understand that so, everybody's in a different place. And this goes back to that, that definition of church health that I gave right. at the beginning of last episode, yeah. where like church health looks like, Mature people, immature people, non-believers, all gathered together, assembling together, trying to figure out how to follow Jesus. Yeah. And that means that all of us are going to be in a different place, and we need to learn how to love each of those people in their place and to help them move forward Yeah, from that place. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's just so, so incredible, you know, for us— we're on staff at a church, right? Right. And so if we were to disengage, it's disengaging from a job. Right. You know, you, you have that kind of dynamic that we don't, you know, get to interact with. And so even from like a pastoral ministry level, mm. you know, I, that's something I had to talk teach myself is, you know, like, well, like why is someone disoriented or demotivated, discouraged, disembodied? You know, why are they allowing those things to kind of stop them from reengaging? And, mm. you know, I've got to remind myself that, you know, it is different. And, as I, th- I think I mentioned it in our last episode, is I can very much relate. I, c- I can relate to that demotivated piece, is kind of seeing failures within the church. And there's been times in my ministry where you know I've seen some failures in the church that I'm like, do I want to keep doing this? Mm-hmm. You know, and and so I have to kind of remind myself that if I've kind of experienced some of that, you know, it's you know individuals who are just you know participating or members of the church and not paid staff can very much experience any of these. And I've got to be more mindful and more aware of that. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's important for us to remember. I think it's important for us to view ourselves as members of the body. Yeah. As pastoral staff. That's right. And that those who are listening, I want to encourage you to remind us of this on a regular basis. Sure. We are members of the body. Our function is different than the function of other people. That's right. Um, and so, uh, you know, and we need all of the members to function well. Yeah. And so we need to remind ourselves that we are members of the body and that primarily is our calling. And then outside of that, we, we perform the function that God's called us to. Um, but yeah, for sure. Like, and that, it goes back to that idea of empathy for those mm-hmm. who aren't really sure what empathy is. It's just this idea, this ability to feel what other feel, other people feel, Yeah. um, to look at another person and be able to gauge where their emotions are and then in, in enter into their emotions with them. Uh, yeah. not saying that you affirm those emotions. It's just that I understand, I understand your emotions. Yeah. And so, so we have these individuals that we've spent the majority of the past two episodes kind of talking about are the ums who understand the importance of church Mm -hmm. understanding you know really understand the importance of relationships understand their need for jesus but have disengaged Mm -hmm. and historically you know within the church specifically in america the idea has been you know let's invite them to church right let's just invite them back make them feel loved and welcome them back in specifically to the sunday morning gathering Mm -hmm. and What research is showing is that that Sunday morning gathering is not necessarily the first step or kind of, you know, people aren't as open to walking into those front doors any longer. Mm-hmm. Um, for whatever reason, um, you know, perhaps individuals, these these individuals that we're talking about, the ums, they've experienced church. It's not like, oh, let me go see what they're doing or what they're talking yeah, I'm not, about. I'm not familiar with this. Yeah, they're okay. familiar with it, and so they're not they're not reengaging in that way. And that, But that's historically where we've placed a lot of emphasis within the American church is how do we make the Sunday morning experience, for lack of a better term, the best it can possibly be so that we can invite our friends and those who are outside can kind of come in and get that first glimpse of the church, of Jesus, and get connected from there. Mm -hmm. But as I mentioned, research is showing that that's not necessarily the on-ramp any longer Mm -hmm. um, for, you know, community, pastoral care, and those types of things. So if if this is no longer the on-ramp, if Sunday morning is not the central on-ramp for specifically your ums, what does that look like? How do we begin to 
make this shift from and kind of away from making Sunday morning the only ramp. You know, I don't want to say the most important, you know, or anything like that, because as we talked about before, Sunday morning gathering is very important Mm -hmm. and there's a tremendous value in that. And there are still some who would use that as an on ramp. Yeah. But right now it's our only on ramp. Right. So, so what, what, what do we? What do you think we need to do to move forward and create additional on ramps to this? You know, yeah. to be engaged. So I think there's two parts to that. Um, the first, Mike Mike Moore, the author of the article, "The Rise of the Alms." That's what we've been discussing. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're interested, go find it in Christianity Today. Um, that's that's where you can find that particular article. Uh, he makes the case that, and I would agree with him, that it starts with a theological understanding of ourselves. Um, who we are, what the church is, theologically, what the concept of home is, and family and community is, theologically. When we understand that, the the second part of this is going to be a lot easier. So the first part of that, the theological understanding, is rooted in this idea that home is wherever God decides to place himself. Hmm. Um, and he kind of walks through, like, if you look at this biblically, we see God... It, first making himself at home in the Garden of Eden mm-hmm. with Adam and Eve. Uh, and so we see home being a plot of land. And then he makes himself at home with the Israelites in the wilderness, a, a tabernacle that travels from place to place. So all of a sudden the presence of God, the, the, the person of God is mobile. Uh, it goes with them wherever they go, this people, yeah. right? <laughs> then we see another stationary home built for in the, in the temple. Uh, De- uh, Solomon builds the temple. Uh, David wanted to build the temple. They they build this home, quote unquote, for God, and His presence dwells there. Then they fall into sin. Temple is destroyed. Uh, they, they fall into idol worship and ultimately lose the presence of God in the sense that He's no longer dwelling in this stationary place. And then He sends Jesus. Yeah. And we see the tabernacle actually. If you go back to Acts chapter seven, Stephen's speech there. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, go and I would encourage you to go and read this. Stephen is is talking to, they've made the accusation against this man named Stephen who uh, was an early church leader, and th- they made it the accusation that he has spoken against God and against God's temple, basically like the the Jerusalem, and he's like, listen, you've misunderstood the whole time. God's presence wanted to go with you wherever you go. The temple's great and everything, but like ultimately, it's just symbolic of the fact that where you reside, God will reside with you. Yeah. Wherever you go, God is going to go with you. And he's like, when Jesus came, what happens is that 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 temple, that that structure, that building is destroyed, but the presence of God is not lost because Jesus, being the new temple, comes, builds this brand new family, this brand new kingdom, and puts his spirit inside of them so that wherever they go, the people of God go, yeah. and God goes with them. And so I think the first step is understanding that God is with us wherever we go. Home for God is not the sanctuary at yeah. Ridgecrest Baptist Church or Broadmoor uh, right down the street or First Pres right down the street or St. Matthew's across the street. He doesn't. That's not home for him. It's not the house of God in yeah. the sense of like the terminology that we kind of use sometimes. Mm-hmm. We are the home of God. He he abides in us, and we abide in Him. We talked about this in First John. That's what we've been going through as a church, and that means that He's taken up residence with us by the way of His Spirit. And so yeah. wherever we go, His Spirit goes with us. And when people interact with us, they interact with the Spirit of God, or yeah. they should. Yeah. Okay. So. That's the theological underpinning. That's right. What that means from an implication standpoint, especially for people who are alms and have disengaged from the physical structure of the church, the the, the the building, it means that we go to them and we meet them where they are. Yeah. We give them ways to step into community that aren't traditional in the sense that, like, you got to come on Sunday morning and be a part of this large congregation. Maybe... Maybe I start a Bible study in my house and I invite a neighbor that has been disengaged from church. I have I had a conversation earlier today with a church member uh, that was talking about uh, we've been encouraging one one of our neighbors to come for a long time. And she says, I know I need, I need to go. Mm-hmm. Um, but every Sunday they get in the car and they drive and she's outside and she's not going with them. Yeah. So maybe it looks like I'm going to create a space for them 
to engage with the community of God that's outside of our traditional parameters. Maybe it's a different day of the week. Maybe yeah. it's in a different place. Maybe it's at a restaurant. Maybe it's maybe it's at the baseball fields when kids are practicing. I don't need to watch Johnny hit the baseball fourteen thousand times. Yeah, he he'll be fine. That's that's right. what coaches are for. Yeah, he does, Dad. He does not need you yelling at him. Don't drop your don't drop your elbow. Don't drop your back shoulder. He doesn't need that help. His coaches are doing that for you. What you can do is during that time engage with the people around you and start having spiritual conversations. Yeah. Um, and what you'll find is like all of a sudden you have an opportunity to to reach your community, reach maybe some of these people who want to re-engage but don't know how. Yeah. And it's through those gentle community-based re-engagements that all of a sudden they're like, yeah, I will come back on a Sunday morning. Right. You know, and, and I think, you know, this isn't anything new. The church no. has been talking about this for a long time. Yes. And, but... For whatever reason, we've just you know we've just not done very very good job with it. Um, we haven't and, had to. Yeah, I, I, I do think that's I do think that's the issue is that we can talk about it, but until you're really forced to do something, right. you're not you're not really being intentional with it. Right. Um, you know, and I <clears throat> as I read the article, and he specifically was like talking about you know when when God's presence you know was in the tabernacle and you mm-hmm. moved around, I immediately kind of thought of within this culture because that's kind of what it comes back to, right? Is you know, God's presence moved with them in the wilderness and was with them. And even though, you know, you had the temple period and all that, and you have Jesus come back, now all of a sudden it's going back to this kind of mobile where you don't have to be locked down for to experience the uh, presence of God. Right. And I, I couldn't help but think of, you know, like right now you have the tiny home movement. Yeah. And a you lot of... you talked to me about a tiny home before. Yeah, yeah. You have this idea and you have a lot of people like, you know, on TikTok, you know, I'll see people all over TikTok who have you know, either quit, quit their full-time jobs or, or have went completely remote working mm-hmm. digitally online, sold everything they got, moved into a tiny home so they can just travel around, you know, under current model. If we had someone in our church, a church member who said, Hey, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to sell my house, go into a tiny home so that I can spend the next, you know, however many years of my life traveling around mm-hmm. and, you know, Hopefully they'd use that as an evangelism opportunity, interact with different people along the, on the along the way, right? Right. You know, and different people they interact with. Under current church metrics, as we kind of talked about in the last episode a little bit, and you know perhaps more in future episodes, that would be viewed as a a failure, a failure in the church because now all of a sudden you have a couple who is no longer attending church every attending Sunday morning service every single Sunday because they are traveling around. But what you don't see is what if this couple is intentionally traveling around and as they're staying in these different places and seeing these different sites, they're being intentional, sharing the gospel, building community, having a small group Bible study as an extension of the church, right. you know, and doing that. And again, I'm not saying this as a like substitute for, you know, having a local community body of believers. It can be a both and. It can, you know, and, and we, we get into this such a polarization where it's, right. we've, we've got to make the focus make people here every single Sunday. That's the win versus, you know, how can we equip, motivate, and push them to be the church Mm -hmm. even when they're not here on a Sunday morning? Wherever they go, especially when they're not here. Yeah. Because that's what the world needs. It doesn't need – the world isn't like, oh, man, like I'll drive past church on Sunday morning. I just – I wonder what I'm missing. Like – Yeah. Yeah. For the most part, people who don't want to be here aren't here. Yeah. And there's a lot of those people. Right. And we have to create a community that's so compelling to the outside world that they're like, I want to be a part of that community. And they can't see it when we're just inside the walls. Like yeah. they, they don't get to experience that with us. Right. So one of the things that we as a church are trying to do more and more is find ways to be out in the community as the people of God together. Right. Like we're doing things like having prayer tents in, in our local park. Um, we are discussing as a staff the idea of a worship in the park event where on a Sunday morning instead of meeting here mm-hmm. and having worship in our traditional way, we're going to go out to the park and have worship out in our community yeah. and invite our local, especially our neighborhoods right around, to be a part of that yeah. and and make it something that's fun and engaging for them and a chance for them to to meet the people of God and see what the community of God looks like and l- help them to understand why we together believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's right. And and we've got to continue to push ourselves outside of these walls, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and um, you know, we we as we as staff, we as members, we as you know, just the general body of Christ have to figure out how to engage with people, you know, and mm. um, <clears throat> I think we are really bad at that. You know, we we are really good about being kind of reclusive and kind of pulling into our inner circle and not wanting to to venture out in any way because a it's not what we've always known b it involves some vulnerability mm. um you know and i can't remember if i started with one or a and then went to b or yeah, I I, i'm not one. sure so i'm i'm, I'm kind of nervous now if i go c or if i go back to three i, I don't know where i where i was you're but, wide, you can go wide open here it's, yeah that's right so we have a person on staff that does it on purpose every single time he does it well that's true <laughs> and so but but I think, you know, we, we've got to get to the part where we recognize our faith in Christ is not only the opportunity to just come together and worship with our words, mm-hmm. you know, whether it be through sermon, music, but it's actually living it out every single day. Yeah. And, you know, I think our people are already, you know, missing some of those weekend gatherings to some degree, right? You know, yeah. even, even, you know, because research now says... Basically, if someone attends the church twice out of the month, that is attenders. a regular attender, yep. you know, actively engaged. You know, when church metrics, when we're trying to keep track of numbers and things like that, we're like, oh, we're only seeing fifty percent of attendance, right? We see you twenty six weeks a year. Yeah, and so twenty times, twenty six times a year. Yeah, that's basically what we say. And so, so it looks really bad, but if we start revamping and becoming more intentional, now I don't, you know, I don't look at it as well. It's okay for me to miss this week because. I don't need in this role, or I've been there all these other weeks. It's okay for me to have one I miss. Mm-hmm. Retrain our mind to say, even though I won't be there this Sunday, I will be the church wherever I'm at. Yeah, yeah. So I want to finish this discussion. What? what yeah. Uh, and piggyback on what, exactly what you said. This is what Mike Moore says to finish the article. He says the social architecture of the church can and should extend beyond buildings and into the social spaces wherever God's people dwell. So if uh, on Sunday afternoon you are a travel baseball parent and you're at the baseball field, you need to understand that you are a member of the people of God in that place. And so God's presence has gone with you into that place. Yeah. And you are a, a person that can extend God's presence into that place. And he finishes up with this. All of us, the people of God, are constituted by the person of Jesus. As Jesus expended, ex- extended God's presence beyond the temple and into the homes of Simon and Andrew, Mary and Martha, Zacchaeus and Jairus, he still knocks on our doors today. May the King of glory come in and make himself at home. And that's a reminder that when you go and knock on your neighbor's door, you are trying to invite the presence of Jesus into that person's house. Yeah. Or you should be. That's right. And we function in the same way Jesus did as he went to these individual people. He created a community where, and all of these people, for what we know, follow Jesus. Yeah. Simon and Andrew, Mary and Martha, Zacche- uh, Zacchaeus and Jairus, all of them mm-hmm. followed after Jesus. That's right. And in the same way, if we go and we love people where yeah. they are, instead of telling them they got to come to us for us <clears throat> to love them, we go to where they are and love them there. All of a sudden, like our community's changed. That's right. You know, and I loved in the article he, he specifically mentioned, he said, you know, we've got to recover a social architecture that mm-hmm. centers on people rather than properties. Yeah. You know, historically, church in America has centered on properties. Here's the church. Come here. Attend here. Participate. Mm-hmm. Best of your ability. We've got to step away from that and get, get creative and kind of recover this idea of the church is about us being the body of Christ, interacting with people in our community. Yeah. And if we miss Sunday morning because I'm just wanting to stay at home and take a nap. Okay, there's an issue with that. Yep. If I'm missing Sunday morning because my kid has a baseball tournament, um, but I'm going to go to that baseball field and I'm going to spend some time intentionally talking to the other parents, you know, sharing the gospel, having gospel conversations, saying, "Hey, before the game, let's get together for a short devotion." Mm-hmm. You know, let, you know, let, how can let's have a time of prayer, pray for one another. You know, if we're being intentional in that way, I think the church looks completely different in a much healthier way than it has been if whether we have a bunch of people attend on a Sunday morning. Yeah, I agree. And so to those of you who listen to the podcast, and you know, specifically if you're a church member at Ridgecrest, you know, really encourage you to be thinking through this and thinking what that looks like to 
move beyond the walls of the church into our community and neighborhoods, families, you know, all those types of things so that way we can figure out how to be more effective at being the body of Christ where those who are unchurched, whether they're nuns, duns, or ums, interacting with them on a regular basis in a way where they feel safe and comfortable to be able to reconnect. Um, if you fall in one of these categories and you're kind of saying, well, I, I don't know how to re-engage and want to talk to one of us, we're here and I'd be happy to, you know, have continue this conversation. If you have any other questions, you know, as, as always, you know, let, let us know. Um, but uh, as always, we hope you have a great week and we'll see you next time.